As I start my message today, and as I start many of my messages, one of the things I like to do is to ask an icebreaker question. It's something that you can discuss with the people around you, but if you're like me, you've probably noticed there's not a lot of people around you, maybe a couple of family members, and uh, let's be honest that the message that we're going to talk about today, or this icebreaker question, it's one that you probably don't want to ask, or it's probably one you don't want to answer in front of too many of your family members. The question is... Have you ever walked away from someone or something? Maybe it was a job or a school activity. It was a situation or even a person. Was there something in your life that you decided would be for the best that you had to get away from because it was making you upset or was otherwise hurting you? To be honest, I have, and, and uh, a few times actually. As I look back at those few times that I've, I've decided that I needed to walk away <laughs> One of them stands out best to me is it's the first one. I was approximately four years old, and I don't know what it was. Uh, just something happened at home. I don't know if it was I didn't get the food that I wanted or, or I didn't get to play with, with the toys that I wanted to play with. But at four years old, I got so angry, I decided that I was going to run away from home. And so I, I grabbed my, my small little backpack, and I... I fill my backpack up, and, and I grab my sleeping bag. It was a, wasn't this one. It was a, a Ghostbuster sleeping bag. But I grab my sleeping bag. I shove it in my arm. I got my backpack, and I march out the door. That's it. I'm done. I am determined to run away from home. I didn't make it far. I made it probably 50 yards down my street, not even to the end of the cul-de-sac, before my dad chased me down, and he scoops me up with my backpack and my sleeping bag, and he carries me home, and I'm kicking and screaming. But unfortunately, I know a story of a guy who also decided, for whatever reason, that it was in his best interest to run away from home. Before he left, he packed his bags, but not with, with the toys of a four-year-old and a Ghostbuster sleeping bag. He packed his bags with half of the money from his family's accounts. And while he was doing so, he was telling his dad that he wished he was dead. And unlike in my story, the guy's father never chased him down. He let him go. And off the guy went. This story might start to sound familiar to you, and I am referring to the story of the prodigal son found in Luke 15. It's one of a handful of, of tales in Scripture that speak to a question that I've received repeatedly in my preparations and my journey through the existential series that we're going through right now. The series of uh, questions that we're wrestling with, these big existential life questions, and we're looking at what answers God has for us. The questions that I keep getting in regards to today's message are things like, just how far can I go and still be saved? And is there a point of no return for God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for this opportunity and the ability to be able to share your word with our congregation, wherever we may be. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us as we, as we are scattered and help us to hear your voice calling to us, speaking to us, that we might not be lost. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us now as we open your word. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I say over and over again as I, I talk about spirituality and, and your relationship with God is that it is, should be a relationship. And it's been said so many times, it's a cliche at this point, the key to relationships is communication. And honestly, it's one of the things that makes this preaching format difficult. It's, it's often talk, tough to talk and to get no acknowledgement that anybody is listening or anybody understands what you're saying, and to, to not even know that you're being heard, it's, it's tough to do that. The more you talk without any sign that someone is listening, the less you'll want to talk. It shouldn't take a lot of effort to prove that talking is important in general, relation, in general relationships, and it's not hard at all to prove that God likes to talk with us regularly in our relationship with Him. He's given us His Word where He'll speak to us, and hopefully on a daily basis, He'll, he'll give us some encouragement for the day or, or as we go through our lives. And He'll also do that scattered through the day with uh, special revelations that He gives us uh, in nature and, and interactions as the Spirit speaks to us and guides us. It's not tough to prove that God likes to talk to us. And it's probably, hopefully, not tough to convince you that we should be talking to God too. We should be opening up our heart as we're talking to a friend is the way that we describe prayer. And if you don't understand the idea of talking to God through prayer, I'd encourage you to uh, hit the pause button on this, on this video and, and go and, and study up on prayer and then come back and resume this. Uh, but 
If the problem isn't talking, then obviously the, the problem is the other half of the communication, and that's listening. And I don't mean just hearing. I mean active listening. I once heard a comedian say, my wife said to me, you don't listen to me. And I thought, that's a strange way to start a conversation. It's been said that many people don't listen so that they can understand. We simply listen so that we can reply. When someone talks to us, as soon as we hear a key word or or, uh, the general direction that they're going, we'll often just tune out what they're saying and focus our our thoughts on what we are going to say back, uh, being ready to say, I had the same thing happen to me. Let me tell you all about it as we take back over the conversation. When this happens, we'll switch the, uh, the processing from listening to just hearing and then waiting our turn. We will hear a lot, but we truly listen very little. Noise will enter our ears, will occasionally reach into our brain, and it'll seldom land in the heart where it's supposed to go. And perhaps no story in the Bible better illustrates this communication disconnect than the story of the book of Jonah. God told the prophet Jonah to get up and go, and that's about as far as he made it in Jonah chapter 1. He heard that God told him to do something, and it didn't make sense what he was telling him to do and why he was telling him to do it. And so he tuned out God, and he decided to get up and go, and ended up going the opposite direction from where God wanted him to go. The next thing you know, it's raining cats and dogs. Jonah's on a boat. But he's being flung off of that boat and going to take a swim in the Mediterranean Sea. Let's make no mistake about it. In the famous story of Jonah and the whale or Jonah and the fish, Jonah went off that boat and into the sea because of his own stupid actions. Something that I've learned from Andrea and I've shared it with you a few times over the course of this series. Stupid actions have stupid consequences. And the next thing you know, Jonah is not only in the sea, but you know that he ends up in the belly of the fish. And here's a remarkable thing that happens in the often overlooked chapter 2 of the book of Jonah. In Jonah chapter 2, we find this incredible prayer that Jonah shares from the insides of the fish. And as I open my Bible, come on, there we go. As I open my Bible to Jonah chapter 2, and as I read through this, this prayer, you can almost picture, that you get the visuals, you can see in your, in your eyes, or in your, in your mind, I can see Jonah going through the process of sinking and drowning. In verse 3, for example, it says, You cast me into the deep and, the heart of, and into the heart of the seas, and all the floods surrounded me. All of your waves and billows passed over me. So just Beginnings of, or through verse 3, we've seen him go from treading water to starting to now sink as the waves pass over him. And then I said, I'm driven away from your sights, and, and yet will I look again into your holy temple. And in verse 5, we see that the waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. And at the end of Jonah chapter 2 and verse 5, we see this phrase that the weeds were wrapped about my head. The weeds, obviously, would be seaweeds. Seaweeds don't tend to be at the top of the Mediterranean Sea. They tend to linger more towards the bottom. And so Jonah, in just a couple of verses, has gone from treading water at the top to sinking with the waves passing over him, and he's now down at the bottom of the sea. And to be honest, if you've ever sunk that far and you're tangled up in the seaweeds, that's pretty much the end of your story, or at least it should be, except that we're dealing with God. As the prophet now sits in his uh, Lent-friendly timeout and reflects on his situation and what he went through as he, as he left the ship, entered the sea, and then appeared to be hitting the end of his life, we learn an important truth about God and listening. Jonah's prayer in this chapter of Jonah chapter 2, Jonah's prayer opens and closes with the fact that we are never so far away, we are never so deep into our own stupidity that God cannot hear us and reach down and save us. The prayer opens, I cried out to the Lord out of my distress and he heard me and answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried and you heard my voice. We are never so far away. We are never so deep down in our own stupidity that God can't hear us and save us. And that's good news. 
Unfortunately, the communication breakdown that we have in our relationship with God, the problem isn't with him talking, the problem isn't with him listening. The problem is with us not listening to him in a way that seeks to understand. In Jonah chapter 3, Jonah quite honestly preaches the shortest sermon I've ever heard in my life. And he gets 120 people to convert. Like seriously, in Jonah chapter 3 and verse 4, he says, Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the world just changes. Those nine words, he gets the capital city of his enemies to repent and to turn their lives to God. Jonah does something amazing and and outstanding, or God does it through him in Jonah chapter 3. And in Jonah chapter 4, we we discover that something sad has happened. In Jonah chapter 4, we see Jonah march outside the city, and he takes a seat, and he decides to wait for God to barbecue the Ninevites. Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2 gives us the true problem that the prophet really had, is that he heard but he didn't listen. God's word made it to his ears, but not much further. He says in his prayer in Jonah chapter 2 and verse 4, he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, because I knew that you were gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abundant in steadfast love, and that you're relenting from disaster. Now therefore, O oh Lord, Please take my life from me, because it's better for me to die than to live. He knew the truth of who God is and what he's like. He knew it at least enough to be able to fill out the blanks on a test. But it never really made it past here and into here. The prophet never really manifests this in his life. And the next thing you know, he's in an argument with God, not only about this, but about a plant that comes and goes. And, and at the end of Jonah chapter 4, it's just, the, the story just seems to end. Now, I say seems to end, but that's not really the case. I say that there's more to the story, though it's not recorded here in, in Jonah chapter 4. The reason I think there's more to the story is, after all, what did Jonah do after these events? What happened next? Did he hear what God was saying to him? Did he listen? No, I believe he did. Because what happens next is at some point, I believe that Jonah wrote the book that bears his name. I believe that he finally listened with his heart as opposed to just hearing with his ears. And at some point, the character of God went from just being something here to having a relationship with God that was built in his heart here. Now, let's be honest. In this book, as I read through it, Jonah appeared to be this close to committing something that we would call the unpardonable sin. It's something that's spoken of by Jesus in Luke chapter 12 and verse 10. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 10, Jesus is teaching, and he says in Luke chapter 12 and verse 10, everyone who speaks a word against the Son of God will be forgiven, but one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will will not be forgiven. We run across something that we are considering an unforgivable sin. Like I said, it's called the the unpardonable sin. As we talk about sin and sinful nature, a couple of sermons ago, I defined sinful nature or that capital S sin as a broken relationship. We have a broken relationship with God and it manifests itself as a sinful nature. That is the disease that we're battling. And then we have something known as sins that are symptoms of that brokenness. Now, there are many symptoms of our broken relationships with God that I've heard people actually contend are the worst sins out there. But one and only one of them truly crosses the line. And the crazy thing is, according to Jesus back in Luke Luke chapter 10 and verse, or 12 and verse 10, it's not even blaspheming Jesus and cursing him and denying him. That's not the, the truly the worst sin out there. In fact, reflecting on this passage, I like the way that uh, a pastor by the name of R.C. Sproul, the way he puts it, he he describes this passage in, in these words. You can blaspheme me and be forgiven, but when you question the work of the Spirit, you're coming perilously close to the unforgivable sin. You're right at the line. You're looking down into the abyss. One more step, and there will be no hope for you. According to Jesus, 
And, and I can study you, this with you later. The, the reason that this is such a big deal, challenging the Holy Spirit, grieving the Holy Spirit, the reason this is so important is because part of the Holy Spirit's job as he ministers to us is to be that still small voice that encourages us. It encourages us to repent for past choices and to make better choices the next time around. I want you to forget the picture that some of you have in your mind about a winged angel and a winged shoulder and your devil kind of whispering into your ear. Get rid of that mind where you have this equal 50-50 battle going on. Don't put them here because you actually truly have a member of the Godhead who wants to minister to you here if you'll let him. He doesn't force himself in. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus talks about, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And so he's not here yet, but that's where he wants to be. The problem isn't God working on us here, working on our heart. The problem is that often we won't let him through the door and let him in past here. We almost become like the, 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 the character Carl Fredrickson from the movie Up that came out a, a few years ago, that cartoon Up about the guy with the, the floating house. At one point, Carl Fredrickson is, is talking to the little boy Russell, and the little boy is talking and talking and talking. And Carl says, that's nice. And he turns down his hearing aid because he's just tired of listening. We become like Carl Fredrickson when we don't let the Holy Spirit go past our ear. We just basically say, God, I know you're trying to get us to do something. That's nice, but thanks. We end up becoming like, like I've seen many young people do uh, these days. That They'll never take that ear pods out of their ears because, to be honest, they don't want to let the noise out there into our lives in here and, and really not in here. That unpardonable, unforgivable point of no return with God, it isn't an action, no matter how horrific that action might be. It's what happens when we make the decision in our lives and in our hearts and in our minds that we're going to turn down God. We're going to take that, that voice of God speaking to us and we're going to turn it down, say, that's nice, and stop listening to him. We will take that fragile, cracked relationship with God that we have and we'll take it and we'll just decide to really what we're doing is we're shattering it beyond repair because we've decided that we will no longer listen to God. And when you no longer listen, you're no longer communicating. If you're no longer communicating, that's it. It's over. We basically were grabbing our sleeping bag and our backpack and we head out the door because we just don't want to hear it anymore. And unfortunately, in many of our lives, and especially when we're dealing with God, there's nobody around to stop you. When we decide in our hearts that we're going to shut off God and slam out the door and we're not listening to him anymore, what often happens is that, like in the story of the prodigal son, he doesn't chase after us the way that we'd like. It, uh, it's basically the story of, the, the, of Luke chapter uh, 15, starting in verse 11, the story of the prodigal son. When the prodigal son marches out the door, Admittedly, the father is rather passive. He doesn't chase, down the, the, uh, chase us down like the lost sh uh, sheep, and he's a shepherd going to search for us. It's the, you know, the passage that we found in our scripture reading. We, doesn't, we don't find, like we find, uh, it's in Luke chapter 8, we don't see him cleaning house. In fact, he doesn't seem to do anything. Instead, what he's decided to do is he's going to let us have what we want. He will never force himself upon us. And so when we decide to say, it's time to cash in my inheritance and I'm going to live out my own life, that is a point of which we've crossed the, the line of no return. It's not that God can't speak to us. It's that we just have decided we don't want to listen. We've shattered our relationship with him. We've cashed out and we're done. In fact, the, uh, another way to put it, it's like uh, that this unforgivable sin is like what happened in the story of Daniel. Our adults are studying the uh, quarterly on Daniel right now. It's like what happens in Daniel chapter 5 when you're sitting there and God decides he's going to write with his own hand a final message to you, a, a, a warning that, that words on the wall, and then he's going to send in one of his, his most trusted messengers to come in and speak to you. And he's going to give you these warnings to repent and turn before it's too late. The enemies are literally here at the, and they're going to take you. And the only thing that you can think of in your life is how you can make sure to put a crown on that guy's head for doing what you wanted him to do. And you know that that crown really is about as meaningful as a Burger King crown. Uh, it has about as much value. Uh, in just a few minutes, it's going to be completely worthless. Now, here's the thing. When we study the book of Daniel, 
And we'll come back to the prodigal son in just a second. But when we study the book of Daniel, the, the, the climax of, of the first half of the book of Daniel in that chiastic structure, you get side by side chapter four, the, what happens to Nebuchadnezzar as God is calling out to him and trying to get his attention. And the story of Belshazzar in chapter five as God is calling out to him and trying to get his attention. Both Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar made awful, terrible mistakes in their lives, especially as it relates to God. But only Belshazzar had gone so far as to turn down and to stop listening to God and his warnings. Nebuchadnezzar did do some awful things, but he still heard God calling out to him in his life. And the climax of that story is when God uh, speaks to him or uh, the climax of that story is when he once and for all decides that he's going to lift up his eyes and behold God once and for all. And he's going to listen, with, or listen for understanding as God calls him in his life. It happens over and over again throughout the rest of Scripture. When Samson was down and out, he decided to listen to God. So did Moses and so did Paul when he was still Saul. These men who were headed on their way to being lost, but they had somebody who was calling out to them and reaching out for them and and desperately trying to get them back. We have that in the prodigal son, but in a different way. Like I said, in in the story of the prodigal son compared to uh, God calling out to to Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar, to Samson or Moses or Paul when he was Saul, compared to all of them, it looks like the father is rather passive because he doesn't physically chase him down like a shepherd or he doesn't physically go searching after him like that that, uh, woman who cleans her house. He doesn't do anything, but yet something calls the child, his lost son, to come home. It wasn't because of anything that the father did in the story, actually. It's not because of what the father did. It's because the son realized who the father was. It wasn't the father's actions that called the son back in a way that made him listen. It was the father's character that called him back. Think about it. In Luke chapter 15 and verse 16, he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate And no one gave him anything. He had sunk to a point so low in his life that he was hoping and and almost pleading for for pig food. Uh, One of the jokes I I noticed is that the word pods there in the Greek, the word is carob. He's so hungry that he's even willing to eat carob. That's really, really down in your life. But when he came to himself in verse 17, he says, How many of my father's hired servants... Have more than enough bread, and I'm here hungering. And he starts to realize who his father is and how he truly, what his character is truly like. And so, my question for you today is Can you hear God calling to you with his never ending, all consuming love and that character of who he is? The kind of love that would leave the 99 and come to save you and me. Can you hear God calling with a love that always listens to you for that faintest cry, no matter how, st- how far down in our own stupidity we are? Now, I know that you might struggle with some of the things that you've chosen to do either last night or last week or whenever you've made those decisions in your heart that you were going to turn and walk away. You may be haunted by some of the, the things that you've walked away from, but I hope that God is not one of them. I hope that you are still willing to listen to God that you haven't taken in your life uh, the still small voice calling out to you and say, that's nice, and turn it down beyond the point of no return. The truth is, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling to you right now. He's calling out to you that you might not be lost. He wants you to come home. He wants you to at least, right now, take a step toward him. My question is, are you still listening? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we've had to be able to reflect on the prodigal son of the New Testament, that parable that Jesus told, the prodigal son of the Old Testament, the prophet Jonah, as he turned and ran We're thankful for the truth that you've said about the prodigal son that's in each of us, the one that decides that we've had enough and we get fed up with trying to listen to you and we decide that we want to turn and run away. And we wrestle with whether or not we've gone too far sometimes. But Lord, if we are still hearing you, if there's still something that is is calling out that yearning in our hearts, 
as you speak to us. Lord, we're thankful for that Holy Spirit, still small voice that cries out. Lord, I'm glad that you'll never quit calling out to us. Help us to never stop listening to you. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us, encourage us, bless us. Help us to trust in you and your still small voice that we might not be lost, but we might find our way home and be home with you. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen.